Welcome back to another episode of the General Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about friends and burgers and how something that started as an, uh, an idea just a decade ago um, has now turned into a restaurant chain of 24 restaurants, over 450 employees, and what is, according to Talos Tutkimus, the leading restaurant brand in, in Finland. And uh, with me I have... Uh, hello, my name is Isaac Fagerholm and I've been, uh, well, I'm from Finland, I'm from up north, Jakobstad, and uh, I've been working at Friends and Burgers since day one, mostly with operations, but also business development, uh, marketing, and uh, especially in the beginning, we were quite a small team, so involved in a lot of different areas. And um, maybe I'll start off with just going through the story. So 10 years ago, the, Friends and Burger, the, the idea of Friends and Burgers was uh, was created in, in Pietarsari by six friends uh, who, are, who had... Uh, just to, so yeah. for international listen, listeners, Pietarsari is a small town on the coast uh, in, in Finland. Yeah, makes sense. Good, good uh, clarification. Uh, anyway, six friends and the idea of making uh, a better burger chain. Uh, they all saw that, uh, that it was a big, there was a big trend uh, in, in the US and also growing in Scandinavia with uh, better, better fast food, especially burgers. Um, and um, this whole fast casual segment was growing really, really rapidly. And uh, the idea of Friends and Burgers came about. Uh, it was uh, just basically trying to make as good food as possible and, and uh, food in the, in the similar kind of fashion you would make if you invited friends over. So you'd go out and get the mes- best possible meat and then you'd uh, spend some extra time preparing it and making sure everything is all right with uh, with uh, with your ho- home and setting everything into place and that idea uh, came to be and uh, then um, we worked on the product a few months before uh, it was ready to launch and um, and then we uh, everything was uh, just as it should be and it tasted amazing in the test kitchen when we made a few portions and then we opened in April 2014 mm-hmm. in the Jakobstad and and uh, and we're faced with a whole lot of challenges because after making just a few test burgers we had to make hundreds and this turned in turned out to be quite uh quite difficult so what were some of the challenges in the beginning was it um or first if you could go back you mentioned the better burger trend that yeah. was brewing in the united states um when you say better burgers was it more about the quality of the ingredients or was it about the taste or, or some combination what was the big what was the yeah. biggest difference um they were Go yeah, g- good it. question. Um, the whole idea <clears throat> relates to to basically people moving from fast food to something called fast casual, and fast casual is is uh, the fastest go- growing segment in the restaurant industry still. Mm. And <clears throat> the idea there is that you take uh, high quality food from casual dining, and then you serve it in in a fast food setting, so it's self service and uh, and um, yeah, no table service. Yeah, and then you get high quality food for an affordable price and and. Um, it's made to order, but it's still quicker than casual dining. Yeah, yeah. So this trend was was growing, and, and we saw big chains in the U.S. Five Guys, Shake Shack, growing rapidly, and uh, also in in Sweden we saw that there was a big burger boom, uh, yeah. starting with Flipping Burgers and and a couple of other actors. Yeah, and I think uh, it's important to to point out that this was ten years ago, and the market, uh, the restaurant scene in Finland has changed a lot over the last decade. So what sounds now quite commonplace was actually quite uh, novel, new, and um, there was how how was the reception in the beginning before or before even launching was it was it clear that this was going to be a, a big success that there was a lot of demand for this or were there doubts as to how how what were the kind of the initial reception yeah. um, when it comes to the price point and 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 just like a the different category of of restaurant dining. Yeah, it's it's true. Uh, back then, there wasn't really <coughs> anyone who did anything anything like this, and and uh, of course, the plans from the beginning were quite ambitious. The idea was to create a chain, and I think uh, uh, it was quite funny because uh, already after a few months after we opened, and we only only had one restaurant in 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 a small town in Finland. Uh, already at that point, some of the major Finnish newspapers were um, had headlines about the new Finnish burger chain. And we only had the one place in in, in, in Jakobstad at the time. So it was good. It was right a good reception. The right place. It's exactly. I'm, I'm. I think one of the biggest uh, biggest uh, contributors to our su- our success has been uh, good timing. Okay. Seeing a, a, a big trend brewing and and then um, being at uh, with the right product at the right time 
in the right place. Uh, going back to some of the challenges you began mentioned in the beginning mm-hmm. with the first restaurant, um, what were were these operational challenges, marketing challenges, both pricing? What was what were some of the the problems? I think in terms of marketing and branding, we got uh, most most of the things right in the beginning. We had a, a good product and we had a good price point, and and we got a lot of customers in the beginning, and that was what created the the challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, the biggest biggest uh, difficulties were related to making uh, going from making 10 burgers in a test kitchen to making hundreds and especially with our fries we had a lot of uh, we went in for making our fries ourselves with uh, the Heston Blumenthal triple cooked uh, process which is quite uh, quite difficult and and especially to get uh, uh, even quality Mm. so we had a lot of challenges in the beginning with the fries especially and we got a lot of negative feedback and Mm. and uh, we had to work a lot with the fries. I think we did at least 50 tests mm. of uh, different processes or and different varieties of potatoes just in a few mo- first months. And so um, during all this testing, was it um, going through that many tests requires a vision, requires some some ide- idea, something that you're pursuing. Um, so was it always clear that this is what we're going to build this um, this this the idea of a better burger chain? Uh, that's what we're pursuing and that we're, we're going to get there eventually or were there uh, wh- why the what was the vision what was the the reason behind this consistent and persistent effort yeah good question um i think in the beginning we had we had an idea of what the, what we what the brand was supposed to be and yeah, it has evolved throughout the years and and um we've faced different challenges that have uh, really made us question uh, what's what's actually a part of uh, of the the brand and the company friends and burgers and in the beginning we had uh, we started out with with uh, a few core values um one of them being that we only wanted to use finish finish ingredients only fresh ingredients uh, and then we wanted to make make the food ourselves especially if we could make it better so this was uh, a few of the the main um aspects of the the food or the the food related related values, and in the beginning there was a lot of questioning because we had the difficulties were 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 quite uh, quite challenging and with especially with the fries and we uh, we did some soul searching and 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 um, after we uh, after the summer first summer we actually figured out how to make fries in a good way and and we realized that that this could actually turn into something that's quite unique for us mm. we could be the company that actually is able to make uh, high quality food uh, in the restaurant. Um, and this, um, uh, I'm just gonna tell you a story about what happened after. Because when we figured out the, the fries, and uh, and a better process, a more even process, um, uh, we we realized that we had disappointed a lot of our fans in in our hometown. So uh, immediately after the summer, in the fall, when we got new fresh fresh potatoes, fresh harvest, we uh, invited everyone for free fries. Basically saying that we're sorry we made a we didn't really know what we were, we were doing and now but now we figured out uh, please come uh, come and have a taste uh, it's on it's on the house and that was a hu- mm-hmm. huge success and we actually been we've been doing this this ever since uh, at least once a year mm. um, when when there's a fresh harvest and the potatoes are at their best yeah. we want to invite people in I think yeah just to kind of summarize we touch upon a, a lot of interesting kind of ingredients when it comes to branding one is timing mm-hmm. like that's that's really really important. The second is product, having that, cons- having that like almost obsession with product quality, and and third would be like humility to recognize when you've um, when you've maybe disappointed some customers, you haven't delivered according to to expectations, and to be able to communicate that very openly and, and actually turn it into something, turn it into a positive as opposed to uh, as opposed to a negative. Yeah. Um, I just want to s- mention one quick kind of example to illustrate because you mentioned the fries um, and and how difficult it can be to do at scale because that you mentioned in uh, Shake Shack as an example it's a it's a multi-billion dollar chain worldwide or yeah at least yeah they have with hundreds of restaurants and and very successful one of the most successful perhaps the most successful better burger chain in the world and they also tried to make because they believe in a lot of things that friends and burgers believes in in terms of quality and freshness and so they tried to make the switch couple of years ago, I believe, yeah. from frozen fries, frozen crinkle cut fries to fresh fries made on, in the restaurant. And they had to abandon it because it was just too difficult. So 
Um, it, it sounds very easy, cut up some potatoes, fry them, but it's it's actually very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I wouldn't recommend it, uh, this to anyone else, but we, we kind of figure it out. And um, and if I go back to, to after the summer and, uh, and having those tough discussions about what's part of the brand and what's uh, what are we going to be, um, a- after that, we also we uh, we uh, kind of locked in on on uh, doing the the food in in the restaurants. So we we had a couple of things figured out already. We knew that we wanted fresh fresh ingredients, and then we figured out that we wanted to to uh, find ways to make it better ourselves if we if we could. So along the years, or after a year, we uh, we started grinding our own beef in house. We realized that we could do it uh, in a in a better way. We could get a better result, more fresh fresh beef. Turn, turns into a better patty, and then uh, two years in, we we started to bake our own buns. Uh, before that, we had uh, uh, some local bakeries make it for us fresh, but they didn't deliver on weekday weekends, which turns uh, gave us a bit of a a, a challenge because uh, we sell the most on in the, in the weekend. So the product was uh, was the was wasn't at the, it, its best when mm-hmm. when we had the most customers. So after, after the, all of this, yeah. we kind of figured out that the, when it comes to the food, we also want to make at least the main components ourselves because we can we can make it better. And yeah. at the time, we all also make our, our sauces and uh, veggie patties, uh, chicken patties as well in house. Yeah. And uh, okay, so you, you figure out the, that part to figure out the operational issues, the quality issues, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second restaurant opens in Helsinki, in the capital of Finland, yes. in 2015. Yeah, in spring. And uh, what was that like? Compared to the first restaurant, yeah, it was interesting because again we had a uh, we had a lot of uh, luck with the timing and uh, and in that way we uh, it, it it was quite easy for us. Sorry, it was a big risk, but it was we had a good position because we uh, wanted the second location to be in the center of Helsinki, the capital of Finland. And um, once we got the location, we kind of started telling people about our media about this, and we got a lot of press. And when we opened, we uh, we had a queue um, and and. Of course, we were happy and and ready to to deliver. We thought, but then it turned out that the queue didn't stop. So we went four months with a constant queue, and we had to to learn uh, again to scale uh, from just making well a f- maybe a few hundreds in 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 Pietarsaari mm-hmm. uh, to making thousands a day or thousand a day, and that was a, a big challenge as well. And again, we kind of uh, were in a situation where we went one summer with uh, maybe disappointing some customers. This time, not maybe so much with uh, product quality, but with uh, waiting time. Mm-hmm. And Which again- a big component of the restaurant experience. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. People are hungry when they get there and they don't get, or they get hungrier and hungrier as they wait. So it's not really ideal. But anyway, after the summer, we uh, we uh, figured out how to work. We kind of learned uh, learned through uh, through our Failures. Was there, you mentioned long queue for four months, which is a very good result when it comes to opening a new restaurant. Um, was there anything that you did before the opening that, or was it just the kind of the hype that you mentioned in the beginning? You had press in, in the big uh, like national media already, or what was it that allowed the second restaurant in Helsinki, a much bigger but also more competitive market, to be so uh, successful? Yeah, I think I think one of the main things was the was the brand and the positioning because there wasn't really any any competitors at the time, which uh, can be a risk or an opportunity. This the, at this time it was a, an opportunity because people were ready. There was wasn't just any options available. So I think that was one thing. And then I think the whole th- idea of building a brand to be or building a restaurant to be a chain uh, from the from the start was quite. Unusual in Finland, mm, so it made uh, it more interesting. It made it more interesting. It, it was something newsworthy. It wasn't just one more restaurant opening. It was this is the next big mm. th- thing in terms of restaurant chains. So uh, I think I think that was important. Yeah, and I remember also there was a, a food restaurant magazine that had nominated or uh, awarded Frenzenburgers with the new title of newcomer of the year. Yeah, so that goes back to product quality building, kind of that hype, yeah. if you will. Sure. Okay, so. Second restaurant very successful. Then a couple more followed in in next year, and I think that in in was it in a year and a half you went from seven. Uh, so that was the first restaurant, but seven to one hundred and forty employees. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That, so that's th- that's one of the the most important fact or in, interesting facts I think uh, from my perspective. So in in January twenty fifteen we had set me me plus six em- employees, and uh, eighteen months later we had one hundred and forty. Uh, so that was quite a rapid ins- expansion, and for sure uh, was 
maybe the most challenging times for us. Some growing pains. Some growing pains for sure. And a lot of mistakes. Uh, luckily throughout the years, uh, I think maybe we've made just uh, enough good decisions to cover, to cover the, the mistakes. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so the first, second restaurant was ex- successful, then follows a, a bunch more. They're also successful. Um, what was, was there a point, how long do you, would you say that France and Burgos was able to ride the wave of that kind of the hype wave of being the new comer, being the underdog, being like the mm-hmm. the interesting new brand. Um, when did that switch, or did it switch from then turning more mainstream? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it's hard to pinpoint the exact moment, but we got a few years there in the beginning where we, we were the the new thing. We uh, we were unique. Um, we didn't really have any direct competitors um, in the fast casual burger segment. And we were growing quite fast because we've been opening restaurants at least one every year since we started. So uh, we had restaurants around around Finland qu- pretty quickly. Um, I think it lasted maybe f- three, four, five years. And then slowly we, we started to realize, we started to see new um, companies, uh, competitors um, open up and uh, a lot of good ones um, as well. And um, and we also kind of noticed the shift where we were more the established chain, and we didn't really get the sympathy that we got in the beginning when we were an, an underdog. So uh, that happened, and and that also made us kind of question what the positioning should have should be like. Because in the beginning, we we uh, maybe were more of, um, turned towards foodies and and people who really are into trying new things and new 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 uh, products and I don't remember the exact moment but at some point we realized that we we're not going to be the small new kind of uh, hidden gem uh, anymore um, so we need to be something else and, th- and there we kind of shifted towards being more going uh, for the the better fast food uh, kind of positioning um, before before this we we never spoke of ourselves as, as even being fast food it was kind of a, almost like a Bad curse word, word yeah because yeah. <laughs> um, for us it's we were fast casual and that was like what we were doing uh, but but at some point we re- realized that being better fast food is probably not a bad thing it's it's easier to to kind of for people to understand it's easier for us to understand as well mm. and um, yeah it's kind of one of the the moments where we uh, the brand kind of pivoted a bit uh, from from being maybe a bit narrower to to widening. So yeah, and that sound, looking back, it sounds like it, it seems like a very reasonable, obvious, almost mm-hmm. decision to make. But it wasn't certainly. It probably wasn't that in the no never is. making it, <laughs> never. Uh, and it was probably a long process of ch- internally. I'm I'm, I'm mm-hmm. thinking before even being able to ex- uh, communicate it to to the customers how you're kind of positioning the brand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and also since the ambitions were quite quite um or we had ambitions to be a, a big chain um then we realized that we m- probably w- we need a brand that's uh, that speaks to to uh, to a wider audience mm. and i think actually one of the things that one of the core values as well if since i touched on the food parts making it in a, in house and and from fresh finish uh, ingredients one of the other thing are the uh, main things also as well or two other things that we really wanted to to have a part of the, of the brand throughout the years has been um well, one people, uh, the whole idea of, of friends and burgers comes from from t- treating treating people as as friends and um, and yeah, treating everyone the way you you'd like to be treat, treated as well. And um, this applies to, uh, of course, uh, guests and colleagues, but also uh, service providers or even competitors. So we wanted to make sure that uh, whenever you come in contact with friends and burgers, we are being professional and and mm-hmm. polite and and friendly. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing that we have. Uh, kept us a part of the the brand from the beginning is is transparency and uh, here we have had a quite a concrete uh, kind of question that's guided our decision making throughout the years which has been um, well basically that we don't want to do anything that could uh, cause any difficult questions so uh, having the idea of if someone calls me in the morning and asks me about anything about our food or our processes or our HR mm. or whatever, uh, we shouldn't do anything that makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. And if we realize that something feels a bit uncomfortable, then we fix it before someone before, asks. <laughs> before someone asks. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great, great uh, point, bringing it back to the positioning that there were elements from the beginning that have not changed mm. and 
the idea was never to change them. Even though the positioning changed, there were elements, core elements, yeah. that didn't change. Um, I just want to point out when we were talking about the, the switch in positioning and going after a broader audience, because I think it, it may seem obvious, but but uh, I think a lot of the time positioning is kind of the I idealized, like this is what we want to be, but the actual positioning is what the customers say. And we can try maybe to nudge it, we can try to influence it, but there's like a natural positioning in the market based on what customers think. And when you kind of accept and embrace that, then it everything just makes a lot more sense. So yeah. Penn and Friends Burgers was, was maybe um, trying to, to the, the positioning changed naturally because the com as the company grew, and then the, the decision, the right decision, was to to also ac to accept that and, and change the marketing and uh, the communication accordingly. Yeah, I, I think it's that it's an interesting topic, and and for us, it's been since the first day we opened the first restaurant, kind of the the whole idea of what we wanted the brand to be as as uh, it's not in our control uh, mm -hmm. basically, and uh, and I think for us, it's been really important to kind of. Or, or, or we already always approached it this way, or at least tried to approach mm. it, pr approach it this way. That uh, we we really try to ask people what they think and f try to figure out what people actually uh, mm -hmm. what they see in us and what what kind of what things they appreciate in what in, in our work and uh, and kind of uh, work backwards from there because mm -hmm. that that's um, probably a better way than than us being stubborn and and trying to force, for example, this whole fast casual yeah. thing. On people that don't maybe really um, um, yeah. pay attention that much, they just want to find a, a good burger place. Yeah, which is most restaurant goers. Yeah. Okay, uh, switching gears a little bit, let's talk about some more tactical marketing stuff. So the restaurant industry, especially in, in your segment, it's a volume business, right? That's how you need to get a lot of customers. Yeah. Um, so what? What? Or first, yeah, if we could. Yeah, let's talk about some of the specific ways. How do you think about as friends and burgers sales activations, like short term getting people in, 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 in the door and all the activities that do that versus what we've been talking about so far, which is brand, which yeah. is much harder to measure. Um, and how do you justify those investments in a very notoriously, I'd say, maybe almost uh, low margin industry? So how do you think about long term versus short term yeah. when it comes to marketing? Yeah, uh, good question. First, like if I just give a, a quick overview of the basic economics in in, in the restaurant business. So it's a, it's a volumes game for sure because uh, you have your rent, and ideally you'd have uh, um, out of a uh, hundred percent you'd have thirty like thirty percent in in labor costs, thirty percent in in um, raw materials, and then twenty percent or some sim similar amount in in um, other costs, mainly rent, and then something left for for the bottom line. Uh, but there, the the rent part is uh, is is quite substantial, and, and at some point when you get critical mass, um, you it, it turns quite profitable. So it's really it really is a volumes game, and and um, for us when it comes in it comes to uh, sales activation, um, and we kind of went the first few years uh, just uh, uh, throughout the honeymoon phase, and we we got a lot of press, and we had a lot of word of mouth, and people were just showing up, so we didn't really need anything, and also. It was even part of the brand. We mm -hmm. didn't really discount. We uh, we wanted to. We w didn't want to, to cheapen uh, the product at, at any mm -hmm. point. Uh, we even had maybe like a quite a unusually bad lunch offer, just uh, mm -hmm. one euro off, which is quite um, not that 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 big of a discount. Mm -hmm. So that was the part of the beginning. And here I think it's interesting because, uh, especially after COVID, COVID, and maybe we get to that later. Uh, Th things kind of changed, and we we uh, found some ways to incorporate um, tactical uh, marketing campaigns mm. and and even discounts to to our um, to our brand. And um, but the main thing for us has been we do we don't want to do like um, coup coupons. We don't want to do uh, percentage discounts or stuff like that. That's not really our thing. But we want to find ways to to drive people into the restaurant, mm. have events. Um, uh, big big happenings where we get mm. people to try our food because mm. uh, since we follow up a lot of different uh, quality measurements or KPIs, we we uh, we think we know uh, um, when the quality is good uh, and when the what restaurant works uh, when the restaurant works, and then we want to drive people in and have a try, and especially new customers. Mm -hmm. And then if we do our job in operations, we uh, 
they they should come back and probably well hopefully bring a friend. Mm. As, so would it be fair to say that the product quality is what allowed you to create a lot of brand awareness through mm. PR, etc., word of mouth, without having to spend a lot, um, and it also made a lot of the sales activation kind of redundant because there was the de 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 the demand was still there. You didn't have to go out and, and incentivize people to come in. Yeah, for sure. And, and also, I think it's uh, one of the factors that play, played a role was that we were so new and mm -hmm. we didn't have any, everything figured out. So we also had maybe some operational things. Now, looking back, I think mm -hmm. we, we didn't even have time to, to consider uh, pushing sales up because we, uh, we, uh, there, there was already a queue at the door mm -hmm. and uh, we were ma mainly focusing on just uh, making the best possible burger and, and providing the best possible service. Got it. Um, it's imp it's difficult or it's it wouldn't make sense to have a discussion about the restaurant industry without thinking about what happened in the last well three two two years um very difficult time for the a lot of the restaurant um due to, to lockdowns etc so uh if you could kind of take us back to march february 2020 um what happened how did what happened in the restaurant industry how did friends and burgers respond yeah yeah, it's been it's been um, a tough couple of years for for us as well, uh, as well as the the whole industry. Um, in twenty twenty, uh, I was actually in a, on in a restaurant uh, or at a restaurant exhibition in the U.S. in in February February with some of some of my colleagues, and we started hearing about this COVID virus, and and um, and uh, the exhibition was maybe half full because of the the virus, and and then I when I came back to Finland, it. Uh, it was in March, and we we got the the news that uh, everything is going to be locked down, and for us, it uh, we lost more than half our our sales sales in just a week, and of course, this uh, was kind of a mm -hmm. challenging time, um, both in terms of getting the staff is right uh, um, quickly enough, and also trying to find ways to still operate and, and get the food out to to customers who wanted to eat, um, and uh, I think probably what saved us in the beginning was uh, um, uh, really flexible staff. We had we had a lot of great people who who were able, really worked uh, for the company and and came in uh, to help out and and also took took time off when when we didn't really have any work. Uh, and then we also had a good partnership with uh, Volt and Fedora, so delivery service providers. Mm. Uh, but the first uh, spring, the first lockdown was kind of a shock to everyone. I think. The good thing was the solidarity that our customers showed and our staff showed that kind of mm. helped us through, through the first wave. And then there was a lot of ramping up and, and shutting down through, throughout the last couple of years. So we had two, main, two major lockdowns and, and one half um, in the last two and a half years. And um, I think after the first kind of um, um, shock, uh, we had this decision to make when we went into the second spring and we had the second lockdown and we kind of we kind of knew it was coming and then we we were able to prepare better we in terms of staffing and then we also had a big decision to make which was uh, do we go into de defensive mode just cut costs and and try to uh, survive or do we go more aggressive and, mm -hmm. and maybe offer some some discounts on on the delivery platforms and and try to gain market share and, and try to make sure that people eat our food and, and we have, have work for our staff. Uh, it, it was higher risk, but we ended up going with the, with the more aggressive approach. And uh, looking back, I think it was the, the right call. Um, so after the first lockdown, every other lockdown or major restriction period, we, uh, we went for, for quite intense uh, campaigning and, and uh, yeah, just mm. going for, for market share and, and making sure people eat. Mm. Eat our burgers instead of someone else's. So we've been able to to grow and be profitable despite despite yeah. these very challenging. Yeah. So we have twenty four restaurants at the moment, and and I think sixteen out of them uh, were opened post COVID. Okay. And uh, yeah, profit profitable, yes. But uh, I think especially the the campaigns didn't really, really leave anything uh, yeah. for the company. It was. But it was a strategic decision to make exactly. sure you get the volume in. Yeah, and also we wanted to make sure that people eat. Yeah friends and burgers. <laughs> and we wanted to make sure that we don't lose any staff. Since we knew we were growing, it was important to be able to keep staff, our staff, yeah. um, and the, the people who know how to, to work in yeah. the restaurants, keep them uh, um, with us. And and uh, that also played a, played a part. But it wasn't an easy decision because 
yeah, yeah, basically we were buying sales which didn't really leave anything uh, at the bottom line. Yeah. All right, uh, final question. We're recording this in January 2023. What's, what, what are the plans um, for, for this year and beyond? What are the expectations? Yeah, it's interesting. We don't know everything, and it's uh, uncertain times. But um, and uh, and having been through the last nine years, I I, I can imagine that we're gonna uh, face some challenges or or discuss have some interesting discussions in terms of positioning and brand and and what we want to be next and how we how we are how we should adapt to the, the changing environment. But that what we know for sure is that we're continue uh, we're continuing to grow and. Um, we actually have the next opening next week. That's going to be our first uh, drive-through restaurant. So that's something we're trying out. And, and, and where is that restaurant? That's in Kokkola, also a small Two town weeks. in 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 Finland. So um, we have growth, and we have um, we have a lot of projects going on in trying to improve the the product and trying to 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 figure out what uh, what's part of the concept. Um, at least for now, we're sticking uh, with uh, we will, what we know works, which is uh, making burgers and fries from from scratch in the restaurant and using using um, Finnish um, uh, and fresh uh, ingredients. And probably I should also mention, since uh, it's been a, become a part of our tradition, um, in in the fall we're going to have one more of the farmers' days, which is uh, which has been now it's it's going to be the fourth year running. Where we offer free food to all the everyone who produces food in Finland, not not only our our uh, providers, but anyone. Uh, so one day where where anyone who produces food can come eat friends and burgers for free. So that's gonna that's something I always look forward to trying to give back uh, to the people that make uh, make all of this uh, possible. That's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come on the podcast. My pleasure. Wish you and uh, friends and burgers all. Best of luck and much success for for this year, and uh, that's a wrap. Thanks.